A certain Republican president of the United States of America coined a term which has since become part of our common language, the term fake news. And as you know, it was his standard response for almost anything and everything he was accused of either by the Democrats or the democratically biased press. So that over his time as the president, he used it so frequently that it was hard to know what was credible and what wasn't. And the press were so tenacious in their bias against the president that it became increasingly doubtful if what they reported had any credibility either. So the saga is still being played out in the courtrooms today. When Russia began its campaign to invade Ukraine, President Putin also took the same tact against the world media and what it was saying of his actions. And so as is often the case with the Kremlin and its strategy, he created a smokescreen to blot out the light, a smokescreen of lies to blot out the truth, creating doubt about what he was doing and amassing his troops on the Ukrainian border until it was too late. And in both of those instances, truth became the innocent casualty. And what we see in our world situation today is a case where truth is on the gallows. And nobody really knows what to believe about anything anymore. And that's been clearly played out in the lives of the people we rub shoulders with in the street. Climate change and COVID are world threats, some say. Climate change and COVID are governmental cover-ups, say others. Who's right? Are the scientists to believe, to be believed? Who pays their wages? Is the media to be believed? Who pays their wages? And likewise, who says? Is it religion? Science? Popular opinion? Who says if it's right or wrong to kill the unborn fetus in the womb? Or if it's right or wrong to have same-sex relationships and marriages? Or if it's right or wrong to end my own life at my own choice? Who says so? If there's no truth, or if the truth is so blurred and marred that it's impossible to know what's right from wrong and what's black from white. And because the truth is on the gallows, we are where we are today. In the dark, befuddled, confused, deluded, depressed. But it might surprise you to learn that ours isn't a unique time in history. And that has, this situation has happened often in the past. And so I want to turn your minds back this morning to a time when we see this very clearly and to consider what we've just read from the book of Isaiah. And the particular verses I want to draw to your attention are those first four verses. And I want you to notice, if you will, two things that he reminds us of in these words. And so firstly, consider, if you will, the first word of the book, the vision. Because this little word is what makes all the difference in the world. I suppose you, you might be sitting there and thinking this morning, why on earth are we looking at some obscure writer who lived some 800 years before the Lord Jesus Christ? What on earth has he got to say to us in 2023. Yes, inform me about what lies behind climate change 
Explain to me the arguments behind mandatory vaccinations. These are the concerns that, that trouble me, not what was said nearly 3,000 years ago. I'm not interested in those things, and neither is the world with all its current problems interested in those things. We want answers to our present problems, not lectures about what happened in Isaiah's day. But you see, that's the very problem. And the real problem we have in our 21st century morass isn't so much that we need to discover a way out of our morass, so much as to see where we've gone wrong in the first place, to have created this dilemma, this morass that we're in. And, we, and what we need today, as was needed in Isaiah's day, isn't a scientist or a politician or a theorist or a dictator to tell us what to do. We don't need just another opinion, not even a reasoned or seemingly scientific opinion. After all, the, the growing voices of dissent testify, who should we believe anyway? Who can be trusted with truth? And that's where Isaiah comes in. Because Isaiah doesn't record for us his observations, carefully studied, collated after years of experience, and then explained to us. Now Isaiah records to us his vision. In other words, what it means is that these are not his thoughts, not his cogitations, not his advice to men. These are God's words to men and women. It's the vision given to him by God. To use another one's description, Isaiah's vision is the sight of what God had placed in his mind. To use the Bible's description, Peter tells us this very important thing about prophecy. He says, above all you must understand, above all you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And Peter's saying there, there was this kind of divine afflatus at work, such that what the prophets wrote were the actual outbreathings of God into them. They were carried along. And so what they recorded was what God had revealed to them so that they spoke and wrote without human error. They were given God's message for men. And that's what makes Isaiah and indeed all the words of the Bible stand in stark and total contradiction to any other words ever written or spoken or blogged or twittered. And that, above everything else, is what men and women need to hear today. Not more theories or scaremongering that may or may not be fulfilled, but the word of God that is the truth and will be fulfilled. And so notice firstly then, the message Isaiah has recorded is his vision. It's his revelation that God had given to him for men and women. But then notice quickly who it was that God was speaking to and about. Verse 1. It was concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Disobedient Israel, the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, were no more. They'd refused to listen to God and they faced God's judgment. And now Judah and her capital, Jerusalem, are now being addressed. The people who had up until then mostly not abandoned the true worship of God. 
Only now, things were about to take a drastic change after the 80-year-odd period of Isaiah's ministry. Because after Isaiah's ministry, Judah strayed past the point of return. And so God speaking to disobedient Judah. And we could say that in speaking to his people through the prophet then, that God is still speaking to his people to the church now. To people who say they know and love God, but who like Judah in her day has so strayed far away from God that they're hardly distinguishable from the heathen. So God is speaking through Isaiah to Judah and to the church. And because the church is meant to be God's light to the world, we could say that God is speaking through the church and to the world as well. So Isaiah's message is truly a universal message that spans time. Remember Psalm 119, your word, O Lord, is eternal. And because it's God's words, it's God's words that are speak, spoken to people throughout the world. And so that's my first point. And the reason Isaiah's message is so very, very relevant for us today. So let me pause and, and ask you. Do you feel as we consider this message this morning, do you feel that you're listening to what God has said? And as the word is spoken, that in the same sense, do you feel that it's as if God is still speaking today? Because you see, that's the reason we have sermons. It's the reason why Isaiah spoke. Not because the preacher likes to be in front, the focus of attention. Not because the preacher is necessarily more intelligent than anyone else. Neither because preachers have more interesting lives than other people. The preachers aren't there to talk about themselves. Neither are they there to give you, the congregation, happy feelings. To wish for soothing words of comfort into their ears. In fact, in Isaiah, say that's, that was part of the problem, as it is in our day. False preachers were whispering words and they were crying, peace, peace, when there was no peace. And they were leading the people astray in blissful ignorance. So no, that's not what the preachers are called to do. Preachers are there because they're called to preach God's word. His word. The sweetness and the bitterness of it. Its simplicity and its depth. That's the reason we have preaching in the church. Because God still speaks to men and women through his word. So is that how you see preaching this morning? Is that how you see Isaiah speaking this morning? Well, if that's so, then what about his message? What is God saying through the prophet Isaiah to Old Testament Judah and to us through his vision? Verse 2. Hear, O heavens, listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. And then God lays out his complaint. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. What is God, God is doing here is, in a sense, he's summoning all his created order, all his works of creation, to bear witness against his charge to his people. That's what God's doing. He's saying to the heavens, to everything that fills the universe, the sun and the moon that routinely light the skies day and night, to the planets and the stars who perfectly run their courses, and to all the heavenly creation, he's saying, hear my complaints. And he's saying to the earth, to the continents and islands and seas, all set in their place with barriers, to nature and to the processes that he designed into creation, from wind to light, 
to photosynthesis, to, to all cellular life, to all that constitutes our natural orderly environment as we know it. He's saying to them, he's saying to the seasonal planet, uh, seasonal patterns, to summer and autumn and winter and spring, who never fail to do what they're designed to do, quarter by quarter, year by year. God is saying, hear, O heavens, listen, O earth. Hear and listen to this absurdity that I'm going to tell you. See if you can fathom what I'm about to say. And God is saying this. He's saying, you, as I've created you, inanimate creation, with no understanding, you do what you're told. You always function as you're designed to function. You obey me. But, my children who I have nurtured and instructed and loved and provided for and protected, these of all my creation, those who have been made in my image to know me and love me and obey me, these, verse 2, have rebelled against me. And God is saying in effect, have you ever seen anything so absurd? These are rebels. They reject me. And my good and wise laws for them. God is venting his displeasure through the prophet to Judah. And to and through the church and to the world. And he's saying you're in rebellion against me, your creator and your God. The inanimate created order does what I say. Year after year. Century after century. But my children. Reared and brought up in love, they rebel against me. And what's more, God says, is they rebel against me to their own harm. Because as verse 5 goes on to say, they're being beaten, they're suffering because of their rebellion. So your whole head is injured. And your whole heart is afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness. Only welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. And so because of their rebellion, they're suffering. What a pristine picture of mankind and sin is that. Because of their rebellion to their creator, their whole head, their reasoning, their logic, their evolutionary philosophies, and their whole heart, their misplaced values and their gross perversions, they've become afflicted. There's no soundness, only wealth and source. Verse 4. They're loaded with guilt, a brood of evil doers, children given to corruption, because they have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their back. You see, that's why the world's primary problem isn't about finding a, a solution for COVID or climate change or peace in Ukraine or trade with China. The world's primary problem lies far, far deeper than that. The problem with mankind is it's in rebellion with God. They've turned their backs on Him. And in that absurd state that rejects their Creator, it turns on itself to solve its problems, problems that it's created through its own rebellion. And the absurdity of that state is that They've rejected the only one who can solve their problems. And so they grow more and more afflicted as they continue to turn their backs on. So God's complaint is that men and women are in rebellion against him. And in their rebellion, they dig themselves deeper and deeper into the morass of the increasingly sinful and painful life.
Then God says, not only have they rejected him, their rejected has blotted out the one source of light and truth. And so they become ignorant. They don't know, he says. Verse 3. The ox knows his master. The donkey his owner's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. And so turning from the inanimate creation that always obeys his rules. Now God uses two examples from the animate creation. The ox and the donkey. And these examples are quite deliberate because two things immediately come to mind when you speak of these animals. The first is that both are well known to be stubborn-willed, self-willed, unable to be moved. And the second thing is neither really represent the highest of God's create creatures intellectually. In fact, they're chosen exactly for the opposite reason, because they're dumb. That's why God uses these to describe mankind. And God says, that's what happens when you reject him. Yes, intellectually, you may have the brain the size of a basketball. You may have all manner of letters after your name. You may be a Professor Stephen Hawkins or a Richard Dawkins. You, intellectually, you may be a veritable Einstein. But in terms of spiritual in in intelligence, with your back turned to God, the Bible says you're nothing but a fool. You're ignorant. You're in the dark. You're without light. Worse than that, as the ox, your stubborn self-will is happy to be so. It likes being like that. And for all the means of co coercion, persuading, attempts to enlighten, begging and pleading, you won't be moved. God says, you're a donkey. You're an ox. The difference between you and they being, at least they by instinct know what's good for them. And the ox, for all of his brutishness, when it comes to food, he knows. When he sees his master with the food bucket, he turns and follows the master he knows. And the donkey, push him this way and that, yell at him, threaten him, hit him, and he'll still ignore you. But when his instincts move, move him, he'll meander back to his owner's manger. He knows where he lives. He knows where he's fed. But God says, when you turn your back on him, you're worse than the ox and the donkey who knows by instinct their master. You don't know and you don't understand. You're ignorant. What a humbling observation this is. Man with all of his vast knowledge, garnered over the centuries of research, development and inventiveness, the automobile, electricity, flight, space travel, computers, instant communications through satellites, ultrasounds, MRI scanners, pharmaceuticals, nuclear medication, and for all of that, having turned their backs on God and rebellion, mankind is worse in terms of their base instinct than the ox or the donkey. At least they know what's good for them. But man in rebellion, head and heart corrupt, covered in sores and welts, hasn't the sense to see his state and to return to his master for help. Reason with him. Coerce him. Beg him, plead with him. But worse than the donkey, he won't be moved. He's ignorant. He prefers his morass. He'll try anything and everything to reject the light. He will not acknowledge his condition and repent towards God. What an absurd state. Reaping the consequences 
of their foolish rebellion, content to run his course, back turned to God in spiritual ignorance and refusing to seek the help of the only one that can help them with their true problem. What a picture of our world suffering in rebellion and ignorance. But that, that's just the wonder of God. Because God is gracious. And that's the wonder of this prophecy he gave through his prophet. Because in spite of our rebellion and ignorance and stubbornness, yet God continues to speak today as long as his word is preached. And he continues to hold out and to offer forgiveness and salvation to those who will turn to him. Salvation through his son. The central theme of Isaiah. Salvation from rebellion and ignorance. Salvation from sin and guilt and judgment. Salvation to anyone who would see their need and feel their inability and turn in repentance to the only one who can save them. Their creator God, become man to save sinners, Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, have you seen your state? Have you repented? Have you turned to Jesus Christ? Do you know God? Just very quickly in closing. I sometimes think about knowing God in this way. <clears throat> You know when you've been apart from a loved one for a time? And when you see them again, there's just that flash in your eyes that sums things up. It, that flash just sums up the relationship you have with them in one glimpse. She's mine. I'm hers. I think, I believe in heaven it'll be something like that. That long lost and dearly missed loved one, a father or a mother, husband or a wife, a son or a daughter. When you see them again, there'll be that, that glimpse in the eye that says, beloved, you won't need to be introduced, you'll just know. Do you think you know Jesus like that? That when you enter heaven, there'll be that glimpse, beloved. There'll be a sense of, there's no surprise here. I know who I've believed. And I've come home to him. And I know that he knows me. Let me ask you this morning. Is that your knowledge of God? Do you know him? Do you know the one you believe in this filthy morass of blackness and darkness and evil? Is God your God? Do you know him? I'll leave you with that.